Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Business of Sustainability. Today, we have Rob Johnson joining us, the VP of Sustainability and Transportation for Seattle Kraken and, uh, and Climate Pledge Arena. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so happy to join you. Well, I'm very excited to hear more about your, your role and responsibilities um, for both the, the new Seattle hockey team as well as the arena they're going to be playing in. Um, I live pretty nearby, so I think all summer I've been walking by the arena, watching it kind of get rebuilt. It's going to be a new Seattle landmark. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, and it, um, it is actually literally a national historic landmark, Jennifer. So this has been a really incredible engineering challenge to preserve and hold up that 44 million pound roof while we construct a brand new building underneath it and then link that building back up to the roof. And one of the things that we have done in the middle of all of this is add another layer of complexity by su suggesting to all those engineers, well, we know you're all permitted uh, to build out this building one way, let's decide to totally change directions and decarbonize the building, eliminate all the fossil fuels, and I'll add all these other sustainability components. So in addition to all the engineering marvels that's happening here, you know, floating the roof, holding it up, building the new building underneath it, now we're also undertaking all these sustainability uh, construction components too, which has been really wow. fun. And but a lot That's of incredible. <laughs> Can't even imagine. Well, first, I would love to hear more about your career journey. What led you to the Seattle Kraken? Uh, great question. You know, like you, I grew up here. So you know, for me, um, the very first thing that I, I remember volunteering for as a youngster, one of the requirements in middle school was to have an organization you wanted to volunteer for. I volunteered to support Earth Day 20, um, which was having its 20th anniversary way back in 1990 um, and got really interested in environmentalism and preservation. And as somebody who cares a lot about the you know, Puget Sound region, um, I have always had that as a value of mine personally. Um, was very fortunate enough to have a, a career in urban planning uh, mostly focused in the environmental and nonprofit space. So a lot of my work has been, how do we preserve farmland and forest land and ensure that we have dense cities, um, you know, not build giant big parking lots and garage mahals, but instead big, great public transit infrastructure um, and use that as a way to really bring people into environmental and conservation work. Um, I translated that career in the nonprofit space into a couple of years on the Seattle City Council where I was fortunate enough to serve as the directly elected representative for Northeast Seattle for three and a quarter years. Um, and on that, uh, at that time, shepherded through some really big environmental um, pieces of legislation, including the, the city's first major zoning uh, changes to really help the city meet its growth challenges the biggest uh, public transit infrastructure package in our region's history with the expansion of our ST3 light rail system and a whole host of other things. And then I got hired on by the team in the arena to help them think about their transportation challenges. And after being there for about a year, they said, you know, we're, we want you to do the sustainability stuff too. So for the last year or so, I've been the VP of both sustainability and transportation, which is a really wonderful job because those two things are really inextricably linked, particularly in our region. Right. And that's something that I'd love to hear more about. I think, like you mentioned, it's uncommon for most sustainability leaders to also have transportation as a part of their purview, but it is really well aligned, especially when you look today at supply chains being hugely impactful to reach sustainability goals. Um, so, so how did those to kind of converge and align? How did your role change when you took on sustainability in addition to transportation? So on the transportation side of things, we were already being pretty innovative before we really took on the moniker of Climate Pledge Arena. About a year ago, we announced we'd be fully subsidizing public transit rides for our home hockey games for fans who might not have an ORCA card. Um, and we were looking at all these other kind of innovative partnerships to ensure that we really reduced our carbon footprint. When we started to analyze the totality of our scope three emissions associated with our building, we realized that transportation of people, of stuff, of artists to and from our building could account for as much as 70% of our total carbon footprint. 
So when you think about those twin challenges together, you have to have solutions that work for transportation um, because they need to work for sustainability. So we, we started to really try to tackle those things together. And we're, we're now really in the process of trying to build out an infrastructure plan that will really work for our fans um, and will really reduce our environmental footprint. And it's, it's um, for me, a twin passion because to, to your point, in our region, our transportation portfolio is the lion's share of our regional emissions portfolio. Well, the team in the arena are no different. So if we're really going to be thought leaders on this, we have to be thought leaders in the transportation space as well. And how does the Seattle Kraken team, as well as the arena, articulate the tangible value of sustainability? It sounds like it was really incorporated since the very beginning when you were thinking about re rebuilding the arena, but how did it become so top of mind and such a priority? Yeah, you know, we're, we're, the, the sustainability story starts with firstly recycling the roof, right? Um, the embodied carbon that we save by keeping that roof and building the brand new building underneath it is the equivalent of the amount of steel it would take to construct a brand new football stadium. So we, you know, by, by keeping that roof as complicated as it was, it really significantly reduced the emissions that might come from the construction of our facility. And of course, there's a whole lot of other great stories about, you know, building the building in the middle of a neighborhood that has a lot of really great transportation choices to it already. So, we, you know, we started with that premise and then we started to build off of it. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it then expanded to, how could we make infrastructure investments in the monorail system, which is a one mile connection from downtown to the building's front door, was originally built alongside the building for the World's Fair in 1962 and needs some modernization. So we're embarking in a public private partnership to spend $7 million to upgrade that monorail system so that our fans can have a 90 second ride from downtown to the building's front door. And once you're downtown, there's a whole variety of great transportation choices for you, whether that's public transit, relatively low cost parking, ride share opportunities. The travel time benefits are gonna be huge if you think about your destination being Westlake Center as opposed to our front door. And it has huge environmental benefits to us as well. That first mile, last mile can sometimes be the lion's share of your emissions portfolio. So. It's, it's simple things like that that we think will really help benefit our fans from a fan experience perspective, but also benefit the arena's uh, environmental footprint as well. I see. And as you're looking at these considerations such as preserving the historic roof and you're able to reduce the carbon emissions from that, are you all also able to reduce materials costs because you're not purchasing a, a kind of brand new materials to build a new roof? or because you're making transportation much more efficient and investing in the monorail system, you're going to be able to get more um, fans to come and sell more tickets. Like, is that how you also think about the impact of these initiatives? It, it's a really great question. So one of the things that we've done here is totally decarbonize the building. So we're, we're aiming to be the world's first certified net zero carbon arena. And that certification program is through a nonprofit called the International Living Futures Institute. We looked at a lot of different folks who do certification programs and we found them to be the most stringent in the world. In order to meet that certification, you have to do four main things. You have to eliminate all fossil fuels from your building. You have to have some component of renewable energy on site. You have to procure the remainder of your energy from renewable sources. And then you have to offset all of your operations from a carbon um, perspective. So we, we're doing the first part. We've totally decarbonized the building. And one of the, the complications there, Jennifer, is we're buying infrastructure that might be a little bit more expensive because it's electric boilers as opposed to gas boilers. Mm -hmm. But the benefit for us is that from an operating perspective, we're getting a much more clean and consistent energy source. So mm -hmm. it might cost us a little bit up front on the capital, but the operating costs are gonna be found to be lower over the life cycle of the facility as a result. Um, renewable energy is another great example. We're working um, to install solar panels on two elements of our building. The historic roof, unfortunately, we can't have solar panels on that because of the national landmark status of it. 
but we're installing solar panels on the atrium, which is the entrance point for most of our fans, and on the garage across the street. That's going to generate about you know 5% of the total energy used by the building. And again, another way for us to think about locking in kind of long-term utility costs, um, as opposed to the variabilities that you might see from a, a utility based off of the energy procurement for our, for our utilities locally. So that we've done a lot of that analysis and a lot of that math and the business case definitely had to be made to not only our senior leadership, but ownership about why this was a good set of investments. And how is sustainability integrated across departments? You've mentioned so many different large initiatives um, that span, it sounds like multiple teams uh, across your organization. How does sustainability really show up in, in their goals that they are, are really focused on? It's, it's a great question. One of my proudest moments was shortly after we, we um, announced that the the name of the building was gonna be the Climate Pledge Arena. We had a senior leadership meeting amongst our VPs and above. And for about a half an hour, various people within the organization started talking about sustainability and the impact that they thought that this was gonna have on their line of business. And I didn't say a word for that entire half hour. So that's when you know that that has really become imbued in the organizational culture. And I'll give you a couple of small examples. The operations team was talking about what are some of the ways that they could work with our food and beverage partners to reduce the carbon footprint and ensure that our, um, our vendors are coming from local restaurants? Um, the team who is working, you know, frankly, on admin issues, we're asking questions about office supplies and where they could source greener paper or greener toner for our, for our printers. Um, the, the team who is thinking about the building operations was saying, how could we find some net metering solutions so we could understand exactly which of our biggest energy users in the building are active at what point so that we could then kind of off cycle some of that load and try to help reduce some of our energy usage in the building. So it started to have this really wonderful billowing out effect where so many other business streams within our um, arena are taking on that sustainability mantle and really innovating on their own without any direction or guidance from me, which is the best kind of innovation. Yeah. How do you think that happened where all these teams just naturally already started to think with um, sustainability in mind? You know, part of it is a real desire, I think, for teams. You know, when, when you work for a professional sports organization or, or at an arena, there's a real team mentality to it. So the idea that we're embracing sustainability at the top from the ownership uh, to the senior leadership on down, that becomes um, uh, something that a lot of folks want to buy into because of that team culture. Um, secondly, I think that's consistent with the values of our region, right? And a lot of folks who are um, getting hired by this team are really excited to come and be a part of the Pacific Northwest and our legacy and our history. Um, and that includes environmental activism. You know, I talked about Earth Day. Earth Day was founded in Seattle in 1970, right? So this is a, this is a place that is known as a, as a hotbed of environmental activism. Um, you know, but I think more importantly for me, um, a lot of folks who have been hired by this organization are really interested in building something new and different from what they've been a part of before. I'm a perfect example. I, I have no business working in sports and entertainment. I'm an urban planner. I, you know, no one that I can ever find has ever hired an urban planner to come and work on their arena's transportation plan. They hire a parking lot attendant manager who gets promoted up through the ranks, who can then figure out how to best optimize people driving their cars in and out of your garages. They don't hire people like me who are kind of public transit nerds. So we're made up of a lot of people within the organization who think that way. And, and that's made it easier for us to adopt a lot of these innovations. Well, you mentioned that, that sometimes it is easy for, for all of these innovations to get adopted. I'm curious to hear about the challenges. What's been one of your, your bigger challenges to be able to implement some of your sustainability initiatives? I mean, it sounds like you already have buy-in from the executive level, you've named the arena, the Climate Pledge Arena, um, but what has been challenging for you? Great question. Um, you know, the, uh, the idea of finding the 
and collecting all of the data from all of these disparate sources, analyzing that data, and then accounting for the carbon footprint of the building is going to be an enormous challenge. Um, that, that so far to me has been the thing that we've identified that when we open, um, we're going to really need to get smart between now and then. Um, we've got obviously very little scope one emissions, right? Um, there's a small diesel generator associated with the emergency backup of the building, which we're trying to find other ways to replicate. But outside of that, we don't really have a whole lot else. Um, but when you think about all of the other things that happen within a building that's as busy as ours, you know, we'll have 200 programmed events every year. So that's an event two out of every three nights. And you've got, you know, 10 to, to 20,000 people coming to and from that event, purchasing food, using the restrooms, the cleanup of all of those people before and after the events, the total amount of operations of this facility. So collecting all of that data, analyzing that data, and then finding ways to really understand the impact of that, whether that's scraping invoices from our food and beverage partners to suggest the total greenhouse gas emissions of apples that might be coming from Eastern Washington versus impossible burgers coming from somewhere else. Um, and then calculating all of that so that we can accurately offset it as part of our commitments. That is gonna be an enormous challenge. And that's what we're working through right now in the final kind of sprint to the building opening this fall is making sure that we've got our operations team and our data teams really well integrated so that we can at least have a, a head start on, uh, on aggregating all of that data and analyzing it and then innovating as we continue to, to learn more as the building operates. So that's the thing I'm most freaked out about. If I lose any sleep at night, it's about all of that data, who's gonna collect it, how we're gonna analyze it, um, and ensure that it's not just me walking around with a clipboard every night trying to collect <laughs> a bunch of data from a bunch of disparate sources. Wow. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us uh, today, Rob. I just have one more question for you. So as fans start funneling into the building, uh, when the team is ready to play, what's the one thing that you hope every fan knows about sustainability for the Seattle Kraken and the Climate Pledge Arena? That's a really great question. You know, when I think about the two things that have really kind of seemed to capture our fans' attention, for the hockey fans, it's the fact that we're collecting rainwater off of one quarter of that roof, holding it in a 15,000-gallon cistern, and using that to resurface the ice on our game nights. That, that seems to be really interesting to a lot of yeah. folks. We call that our rain-to-rink solution, and it's <laughs> not any different from that big sister and you might have outside your home or apartment building and use to fill up the community garden or your backyard gardens. Mm -hmm. but that, that component, I think people are really excited about and we're hoping to be able to translate that into people wanting to take action on their own around water conservation, because that's so critical. The second is the idea that we're gonna be banning single use plastics. When you stand at the arena's front door and you look to the west, you can see the Puget Sound, just like the view from you outside your window, Jennifer. And we know collectively the impact that those single-use plastics are having on the health of our Puget Sound, our native salmon and orchid population, but also our human health. I heard a damning statistic the other day that as humans, we ingest about a credit card worth of microplastics every week from plastic. Oh my gosh. On our food <laughs> That's from scary. Store. It's super scary. And so the idea that, you know, an artist like Billie Eilish could come into a building and say, I'm going to play in your building, but one of the prerequisites one of the riders is that you can't have any single use plastics while I'm in the building. That was inspirational to us. And we thought if she can ban it for one night, why couldn't we ban it for 365 days a year? Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna be able to ban everything on day one, but we're gonna ban most things. And then we're gonna phase out everything we hope by the, the 2024 timeline. So the idea here for us of inspiring fans to really reduce their plastic use and consumption, I think is gonna be a really, really great one too. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Rob, for sharing so much more uh, about your role, how sustainability and transportation really come together so seamlessly, and just more about sustainability for, for the team in the arena. I'm excited to check out the building and cheer on the team when you guys start.
when the puck drops in later on this year, Jennifer, we can't have uh, wait to have you come by and take a look. Um, it's been a real honor. You've got such an illustrious group of people who have been part of this series. I'm very, very thankful to have been one amongst the many. All right. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you.